Thank you. Uh, so let me start by thanking uh, Vandalin, Christina, and the team of uh, people from uh, San Carlos who put this meeting together uh, jointly with SPIE. It's uh, great to see this all happening. <coughs> uh, so um, I also would like to thank Tayaba for agreeing to share this talk with me. The reasons for us doing this as a shared talk, I hope, will become apparent through the structure of the talk. Uh, so we're going to talk about the future of uh, PDT. Uh, in oncology, but you notice it's a question mark. So let me start by saying, uh, obviously, for this audience, you probably don't need an introduction, but photodynamic therapy and photodiagnostics uh, are well known, involving a photosensitizer uh, with some uh, uh, time delay uh, between that and uh, light irradiation, uh, with the light irradiation either having a therapeutic effect uh, or being able to do uh, fluorescence. Uh, imaging or fluorescence spectroscopy. <clears throat> and of course here, photos PS represents the photosensitizer. However, for the purpose of this talk, we would like PS to actually represent a provocative statement. Uh, and the purpose of this is that uh, we want to start this conference by challenging all of us to think very deeply about the future of PDT the challenges in PDT, the opportunities, but to really start to take seriously the question, is there a future for PDT and photodiagnostics? To set the scene for this, uh, we would like to define <coughs> what we mean by PDT, in particular standard PDT, which is, <coughs> excuse me, which is what we all think of as PDT, namely you use a non-targeted molecular photosensitizer that's activated by uh, continuous wave visible or near-infrared light delivered as a single treatment, typically over minutes or tens of minutes, either to the surface of a solid tumor or by interstitial means with no other concurrent treatment or modification of the tumor status, and molecular oxygen is usually required. So that we will call standard PDT, and standard photodynamic diagnostics is the equivalent, but in this case, for the purpose of fluorescence detection. So the structure of the presentation is that I will make some non-provocative statements, and then I hope a very provocative statement. Uh, Tayaba will come in and give a counterpoint to that. So this is a kind of tag team uh, type of presentation. And then uh, I think during the meeting, we want to talk about what's the way forward, and that should be a conversation that all of us participate in. So first of all, non-provocative statement. Standard PDT can work sometimes spectacularly well, to provide significant patient benefit, including in cases where conventional cancer treatments have failed or have even been the cause of the disease. Now, we recognize that in oncology, uh, the standard uh, methods are surgery, chemo, and radiation. So it's like a three-legged stool. You should note that 50% of cancer cures are from surgery. So of 100 patients cured, by, uh, uh, cured of cancer, 50% of them are cured by surgery, 40% by radiotherapy, and 10% by chemotherapy. So it's important to think of in the context of where PDT might play a role. There are many examples in the literature, I just put together this collage, uh, to demonstrate for you that PDT <coughs> can work spectacularly well, standard PDT can work spectacularly well for cancer, including in cases, and this is from Merrill Beal, cases of patients who are in a disastrous uh, uh, condition, who failed surgery, failed radiation, failed chemotherapy, failed the three uh, uh, pillars of, of, of oncology, and are still around years later. And this patient was around at 11 years later, uh, obviously close to death at this stage. So PDT can work spectacularly well. That is not the issue. Standard PDT is the basis of all currently approved cancer indications. So there are a number of drugs, a number of photosensitizers already approved for PDT in multiple countries for a range of different applications. And I think we all know about those. And the standard PDT is really the uh, basis for uh, clinical trials of many other photosensitizers and optical platforms. Examples, our own work on prostate cancer early on. Examples, here's PDT uh, being used to treat interstitially. So, second non-provocative statement. 
standard photodynamic diagnostics, in other words, fluorescence spectroscopy or fluorescence imaging, or image guidance, has shown clinical value for detecting or localizing staging some solid tumors and premalignant lesions, including trials that have led to approvals. <coughs> examples. Here's just, again, from the literature, examples of the efficacy of using fluorescence imaging based on photosensitizers in order to detect tumor that, uh, including tumor that is not clearly visible under normal white light uh, illumination. That has led to commercialization of devices and platforms using fluorescence diagnostics. And I'll just give you one example here. There are multiple. And it's used across a wide range of different applications. And an important aspect of this is, of course, that that fluorescence guidance can be used either to guide surgery or to guide radiotherapy or to guide chemotherapy, but it can also be used to guide PDT. Uh, so it becomes a theranostic platform with the uh, fluorescence being used to guide the delivery of the PDT treatment. So beautiful examples of efficacy. <clears throat> Another non-provocative statement is if you take the same idea of fluorescence imaging, but rather than use it just to detect tumor, if you use it to guide intervention, for example, to guide surgery, uh, then uh, this uh, also has been very effective, has led to trials, including approvals and commercialization. This shows one example. Uh, this is the Zeiss uh, uh, neurosurgical uh, microscope enabled for fluorescence imaging. So one can do neurosurgical uh, uh, resection under fluorescence guided, and we believe, I certainly believe, it will become widely used clinically. And just to show examples, this is uh, of uh, the use of fluorescence for guiding resection in bladder cancer. This, I thank George Wagner for, for, for this original uh, uh, movie. And uh, if we look in the case of brain cancer, this is at the end of white light resection when the surgeon believes that all of the tumor has been removed. But if you switch to fluorescence, then you can see that there's residual tumor. And people like uh, uh, Sam here have been tremendous pioneers in the development of this type of technology in neurosurgery. It's becoming very important. It's approved in Europe as, as a, as a uh, surgical adjuvant technique, and I think will uh, be very uh, critical. And it's interesting to note that uh, uh, those two examples are, are examples within a much wider domain of fluorescence-guided surgery. Uh, so if you look in the literature, uh, there are many, many examples uh, using perfusion imaging, or in this case, using uh, a folate receptor targeted uh, 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 fluorescent agent. So many studies are going on of fluorescence guidance in surgery. Uh, some of them, or many of them indeed, not connected specifically to PDT. But just to remind you that the big advantage if you're using a photodynamic drug for the purpose of fluorescence guidance is that it gives you the possibility to include PDT to a third agnostic platform. So a complete guidance and treatment platform. OK, here's a provocative statement. Standard PDT is doomed for widespread adoption into general oncologic practice in the developed world. Some of the older people may recognize this used to be an old BBC, uh, BBC uh, comedy program called Dad's Army. Um, I want to emphasize standard PDT general oncologic practice in the developed world. So if you look at the place of PDT in general oncology, we've already identified that the current reality of oncology is you use radiation, you use surgery, or you use radiotherapy, and that's it. I think many of us in the PDT community had the historical expectation that this model of cancer care would be transformed by PDT into a four-legged stool where standard PDT would become the fourth pillar of oncologic practice. Is this realistic? So if you look at comparison, one of the other legs, the first radiotherapy of cancer was in 1896. Today, radiotherapy is used in more than 50% of cancer patients, and as I said earlier, is responsible for 40% of cancer cures. PDT developed around the same time, and I would, I would state it's almost invisible in routine clinical practice. So this has developed over 100 years into a major 
cancer control method. PDT, at the same age, is almost invisible in routine clinical practice. And we had to face that reality. To emphasize this, the modern era of PDT, as you know, started with Tom's work and the earlier people in the late uh, 70s. And still, we in the PDT community are making statements like this. 30 years later, PDT is still considered to be a new and promising anti-tumor strategy. Steve Bowen, who's in the audience, PDT is an evolving technique, but many further preclinical and clinical studies are needed to establish its role. So unlike radiotherapy, PDT simply has not made it into routine clinical practice. What are the contributing factors to this, and these are mutually reinforcing? Scientific and technical, we would state that standard PDT has inadequate potency and specificity. And there's many examples in the literature. This is just an, uh, uh, a news report in biophotonics. PDT for cancer depends on improved photosensitizers. And the reason is that if you look at the typical biodistribution of standard photosensitizers, the tumor to host ratio, you're lucky if it's two to one. In some cases, it's even less than one to one. So this means that there is an unrealistic dependence on light targeting to provide the therapeutic window. And that's a big problem. Clinical, what's the issues here? PDT is generally perceived as being too complicated. We have all these stuff, all these bits and pieces to put together, drugs, lasers, fibers, dosimetry, etc. This is a very complicated procedure from a clinical perspective. <clears throat> it does not have a clear clinical champion or a home within the oncologic community. So here's our three-legged stool turned into a three-pillared uh, uh, castle. Uh, it, what is PDT? Is it a surgical laser with an energy transducer, the photosensitizer? Is it radiotherapy with a sensitizing agent? Is it chemotherapy that is light activated? Is it all of the above? Is it none of the above? And I think the big problem is that PDT is a serious branding problem. If you ask the most clinicians in cancer centers, they don't know what PDT is. So we have a serious branding problem. Clinical and commercially, I would say that we've failed to stay the course through to prospect of randomized multicenter phase three, sorry, that should be phase three, uh, clinical trials, without which PDT will not be accepted. We cannot expect PDT to have an exception made for it that somehow we think it's so great that it should be accepted by FDA according to lower standards than any other treatment. It will not be. So we need to get PDT through randomized, controlled, prospective, multicenter phase three trials for acceptance. For example, I went to my own domain. So this is from Cancer Care Ontario. This is the agency that determines in Ontario, where I come from in Canada, whether, whether new treatments will be approved for reimbursement. Not for ethical approval, but for reimbursement. Will the system pay for it? And so they looked at PDT for non-small cell lung cancer, a guideline. And if you look at that document, and they looked at the lack of sufficient high quality evidence precludes definitive recommendations. But if you then look at this, and it's highlighted, the relative safety and effectiveness of PDT compared with radiotherapy remains undefined. This is for non-small lung cell lung cancer, a treatment that's actually approved in Canada. So this is an approved therapy. Uh, this role is not well defined in relation to other modalities of palliation, and there are serious adverse effects. <clears throat> and the reason, part of the reason for this is that the evidence that the, this board was expected to make a decision on was 11 non-controlled studies and one summary paper. That is not enough. That is not enough. It may get you government approval on an ethical ground, but it won't get you anyone to pay for it. And they say that randomized controlled trials are needed. Commercially, most standard PDT companies to date have made a mess of getting PDT into oncology. This is in red because these are the provocative statements. <laughs> okay. What happened to all the startups, and the money, and our effort, and sweat, and blood and tears? Among them, J&J &J and Lederley, 1993, in Canada, the first world approval for PDT, for bladder cancer, was never used, even although it was approved, because of 
the company's failure to take into account the problem of dissymmetry within the bladder, they could have avoided this toxicity. It was approved and never used. That was not a good start. QOT made billions of dollars from the treatment of PDT for age-related macular degeneration. They abandoned their core competency in PDT and decided to become a pharma company. So they took their eye off the ball. Miravant, pharmacyclics, the older people here will remember, dropped oncology to chase AMD. QOT made money out of AMD, we'll make money out of AMD. They failed the FDA and went belly up. They couldn't decide which rabbit to run after. <coughs> Scotia, the UK company, fell before the finishing line. Fortunately, at least in that case, it was picked up, their technology was picked up by another company. But it's kind of a tale of disasters, to be frank. Economic. Standard PDC is absurdly expensive for some approved indications, considering the competing technologies. The drugs, thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. The lasers, tens of thousands of dollars. The fibers, thousands of dollars for a patient. So you look at an approved indication for PDT, like PDT for uh, palliation of, 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 of esophageal cancer, you put a stent in, it costs $100. No hospital will allow the clinician to do this rather than that, even if the clinician claims that this is a bit better. But it's simply not economically viable in the present model. Regulatory is complicated because of the dual uh, uh, combination. Culturally, the three pillars of oncology, surgery, radiation, chemo, they're not really a stool, they're a castle. <laughs> right? They are ramparts. You will not penetrate this unless you have something spectacular in terms of a new technology. You know, castles in the Middle Ages were impenetrable until people invented new technologies that could knock the walls down. We need to invent something that's going to knock the walls down of the impenetrable oncologic castle. The consequences, PDT is almost invisible in major cancer centers in North America. I just look on the website, try to find out about PDT in the big cancer centers. I take my own, embarrassingly which is supposed to be the, one of the top five cancer centers in the world, I could not find any clinicians in my cancer center who knew whether or not we were doing PDT. It's not just in hospitals. I go, if you Google PDT for cancer in uh, Canada, you go to the Canadian Cancer Society, the, the, the main organization for cancer, and its website says photodynamic therapy is also called photoradiation therapy, phototherapy, photochemotherapy. PDT has not been called this for 30 years. And yet that is the information that the public is getting. <clears throat> it's not just North America. You go to Australia, National Institute of Integrative Medicine. PDT has been used exclusively to treat superficial tumors. So it's like, a, it's like nothing had been done with, with deep-seated tumors in PDT. Uh, and they recommend, in fact, sono PDT. Whether or not this is good or not doesn't matter. They don't recommend standard PDT. The UK, lots of discussion in the UK. Steve Bourne can talk to this more eloquently than I can. But again, it's very controversial. So my role was to give you the doom and gloom. Uh, Tayaba's role is to give us hope. And so now I'd like to call on Tayaba, who will show us the hope for the future. So as you can tell, this is all very spontaneous, right? So <laughs> we, this, I have to say that this came about from, uh, I also want to point out we started 12 minutes late. So, you know, it's, uh, uh, so the, it, I was giving a talk in Vancouver at the Optical Society for America and Brian and I ran into each other and he started telling me what he was going to do, a say at this meeting. And as is my habit, I started arguing with him and he said, why don't we just do this together? Because then we can argue on the podium. So, so it's really not much of an argument. We've uh, actually made these slides together for full disclosure. Um, and so, so I want to start by saying that PDT has been, it's non-oncologic, but it has been successful when developed intelligently and with a focus and in the right spot. But 
really it was key to have a good industry partner here. And there are millions of treatments, billions of dollars made. And it was, uh, you know, at one point, this was the uh, top 10 biotechs for about five years. I remember QLT and, you know, it was the good times for PDT and there were uh, many other companies. So it's, there's nothing, I think what I want to point out is there's nothing inherently wrong with PDT that it cannot be brought up into general practice and oncology. Um, in trying to do translational work, I am beginning to find all the problems that exist there. And people like Steve Bowne, who've really pioneered a lot of uh, translational work, have known this forever. So, um, so the same thing could happen uh, in oncology. You know, the exciting thing when the AMD got approved was that it was being taught in medical schools to residents. I think in most countries, not the UK, because the UK decided it's always different. They decided not to prove it. So, but, but you know, in, in most countries that happens. So, so that really is, I want us to, uh, to note that uh, there's a possibility there and it's real. So what does PDT bring to the table that offers us new opportunities? So, um, does the laser work? Does the laser work here? Okay. Yeah, let me try this one here. Yeah, okay. So there are many, many uh, opportunities here, and I just want to point to what, some things that Brian's shown. So, you know, why this will be very good in, uh, in uh, oncology is, Sorry? Oh, I haven't even gone to the slide mode, yeah. No wonder, yeah. So, um, it's, uh, it, it really provides, uh, so one of the major problems in cancer, if you look at mechanisms, is the diversity, the heterogeneity. And PDT is able to address that quite well. Uh, and, you know, I don't have time to go into the mechanisms, but those of you who study mechanisms know about the apoptotic pathway being a major block to chemotherapy, whereas PDT uh, hits the BCL2 and the cytochrome C and actually overcomes that. And that's really one of the reasons I've always been fascinated by examples like this that Merrill has and other people. And it really is because it's actually bypassing the typical mechanisms and taking care of the uh, heterogeneity. In our own work, we'd shown with ovarian cancer patients that not only did targeted PDT get over the, overcome the resistance, it actually re reversed cisplatin resistance. So uh, I think it's uh, also, there's, uh, PDT offers a very special opportunity for upcoming uh, technologies such as nanotechnology. It can be a very strategic use of this where uh, the light can be used not only to trigger the cytotoxicity, but also to release second and third drugs in a, a sensible mechanism-based fashion. And um, the selectivity existing right now is really, as Brian pointed out, pathetic, but I think we do need to have improved selectivity for this to become uh, a broader treatment. And I think to say that this will always be a local ablative treatment is really not doing ourselves uh, service. Uh, so we do need to move beyond the SPDT, as Brian's named it, not to discard it where it works, because it really works well in the, these patients like this, and you know there are many examples, so that's never being advocated. But we do have to get brave, and like all other oncology, uh, 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 development, we need to move forward with, with some more courage and, and bravery. Uh, otherwise, it'll just remain a boutique therapy, and, and uh, as a lot of clinicians tell us, the converted are fine, but most of them say it's too much trouble. I can't really be bothered to do this because, you know, a few cells slough off. So, Brian, so I think some of the, in my mind, some of the upcoming, uh, you know, serious pharma in, um, involvement is needed, other collaborative uh, work uh, with the regulatory authorities, et cetera. And again, Steve's done a super job in London for this. Uh, but you know, there are these upcoming promises. I'm going to talk about some of the things that we think. And again, this presentation is clearly uh, a biased view of the speakers here. Uh, so I think infections really has a role and it needs to get higher profile. Uh, this integrated, the fluorescence guided resection integrated with PDT. There's really not that many papers. Sam's uh, work showed uh, an increased survival, but we need to do more of those. And there's some others that I'll talk about now in the next few slides. Uh, 
so as I see it, uh, there's a really special place for cholangiocarcinoma uh, with PDT in here, and I just cite an early study that really set it off, uh, Marian Ortner's, uh, but this was a small one with, as I recall, about 39 patients or 30 patients in it. But more recently, the work from Korea, from Dr. Chian's team, actually showed that not only does it prolong the patency of the stent, here the comparison was done with stent with and without PDT, uh, but also that impacted on patient survival. Now these were all palliative, you know, these were advanced diseases. So I think, and, and really uh, ev nothing else works here. And now with chemotherapy emerging in combination, this is going to make a huge difference, I think. Um, you know, whether it'll be a cure, we, and, and I understand, I don't know if anyone from Pinnacle is here, they were supposed to be, but um, I understand that Pinnacle is sponsoring multi-center trials and international multi-center trials, and we, we look forward to that. Um, I want to point to another disease which is listed here, and I'm not going to go line by line on this, only to say how pathetic it is, the median overall survival from the cancer statistics says this, and I recall when I first got into this that there was so much excitement everywhere I went in the GI meetings. They said, you know, we can't wait for that paper to come out. I've seen a leak of it. And there's this new drug that's come. It's going to change the way we treat pancreatic cancer. And that was this for foreign ox. So it's such a sad thing that you go from seven months to 11 months and there's tremendous excitement. So clearly this needs something different. And I will point, and then, you know, more recently there's been excitement because this is a nanoparticle here uh, where it goes to 8.5 months with gemcitabine. So, so, you know, these are really poor, uh, sad statistics, and I think PDT has a special role for various reasons, and I, I'll show you that. And, and I want to point out to an old, again, Steve sort of led a lot of these clinical uh, ideas here. Uh, in 2002, he did a pilot study. I believe it was 16 patients, but I may be wrong. Uh, and, you know, there was, again, not a controlled trial, but about 10 months uh, survival here, single treatment, whereas you're talking about the... And this, by the way, I want to point out this whole excitement. This gets me. That's why I'm spending a few minutes here. Is, is so toxic that it can be given only to healthy patients. So you're talking about advanced pancreatic patients who are healthy. So that's, it's sort of an oxymoron, but that's really where it is. So I, th I think, uh, you know, P and PDT really does have a role in these. And I just want to point out with this, because I won't show data, that this has just come out and uh, was unmasked this year. And uh, this is a nanoliposomal formulation in phase three by Merrimack Company. And this actually seems to address metastatic disease to some extent. Again, only to about eight or nine months. But the reason I put it here is that in early in our work, we show, working with this company, that PDT combined with this really does wipe out not only the primary tumor in preclinical studies, but also metastasis, which is rare. So, um, and then, you know, Steve Pereira and, and, and us, we've uh, shown the same sort of a study uh, in a, a second pancreatic cancer study with using vertoporphyrin. And I show this mainly to point out that one thing that PDT does have that we haven't exploited enough is to customize treatment. So we've stuck to the optical approaches very much and say, you know, the photo bleaching and everything, which is all very good. That might give us some custom, uh, room for customization. Now, Brian Pogue here, uh, in the same study that I mentioned with Steve Pereira on the uh, pancreatic cancer thing, started using the standard procedure uh, uh, standard um, uh, CT scans from patients, which Steve does routinely. He takes a scan pre-treatment and post-treatment and use that to, if I could find this, and use that to map out the li uh, light fluence map. And with that, he was actually able to predict in patients the volume of necrosis. So uh, Brian actually let us down and is not coming, so I'll be presenting, trying to present his work uh, in one of the other sessions. But I think that's really beautiful. It takes away doing the photo bleaching and sticking fibers to calculate sensitizers was very, very difficult. We worked uh, with, uh, uh, with a few groups on that. So we're looking forward uh, to our second phase studies in this. And I think there's real hope for that now. And that sort of shows the uh, uh, necrotic volume that was calculated, which fits in very nicely with what was seen clinically. 
So I want to get a little bit actually provocative. This could have been in Brian's uh, red uh, things that, you know, we've always avoided any attempt at addressing metastasis with PDT. I really don't think that's true because again, PDT shouldn't be just where you shine light and where the sensitizer is. PDT is a whole lot of different things. And uh, 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 one of the things to, uh, that's needed to, for that to happen and for us to really move with the oncol oncology field is uh, to really look at mechanisms carefully, but then try to move those on rather than continuing to look at yet another detail and yet another pathway. Uh, and then there has to be some targeting. I mean, every other oncological treatment now does targeted treatments. I don't know why not us. And finally, of course, the uh, great hope is the immunology. So I just want, I showed this picture, which I did about 15 years ago, but still holds, is that any treatment, it doesn't matter whether it's PDT or not, will have these components here, which is called escape pathways. So the one thing that happens is that there's, you do what you want, which is you kill cancer cells or the tissue. The second part is that while these cells are dying or those that haven't died, they really fight. They have a tremendous desire to live and they s start secreting uh, factors or there's a molecular response that wants to live. So the, either these cells will survive because of that molecular response or the dying cells will be uh, recouped. And these are escape pathways. And again, this is a huge deal in oncology research now, as, as, as most of you know. So uh, what we need to do is capture that with PDT. And I want to say that PDT is pretty special because not only does it do this, like every other treatment, by the way, radiation. So before people go around saying, oh, well, PDT does bad things. No, radiation does it, even surgery does it. Post-surgery, you have these responses. But the one thing with PDT is that it sensitizes these, these issues to inhibitors, which if you were to add those inhibitors, you were to abrogate this without PDT, you don't get the same effect. And I'll show a very quick example of that right now. So we need to really capture that. So here's the example. We're looking again at pancreatic cancer. This is preclinical. And what we'd shown in this bad response was that, uh, you know, while most of the cells died, uh, there is, these pathways were activated. And what the obvious thing was to inactivate this. And, you know, we did a lot of time dependence and everything. It turns out you've got to inactivate it right away. There's like a window of a few hours when, uh, you know, after that the horse is out of the barn and, and then it's not so effective. And typically what's been happening is that inhibitors have been added uh, over time. So let me just show you just one slide here. This is a whole. And so we did that in an orthotopic model of metastatic cancer, highly metastatic. And I just want to show you that's, that's the uh, you know, peritumoral, uh, this is the metas uh, metastasis here, uh, stain. But here's what I want to point out. So when you actually administer this combination in that nanoconstruct that I showed you, which has an inhibitor for CE, it's a dirty inhibitor uh, for CMET and VEGF, both, and it's incorporated in a polymer in here, whereas the BPD is right here. So when you administer it as the single agent, you get a dramatic decrease with a single treatment of this, um, uh, of this tumor. Whereas when you mix it, you still get an effect, but it's not, not as much, and BPD by itself seems to also decrease that, but there you could be arguing whether it's the decreased tumor that does it or whether it's, um, um, it's the inhibition. So, so I think that's really exciting, and we're talk we are talking to a pharma to see if we can move this forward uh, with their molecules. So now we're going, I just want to show that the improved selectivity is very important. You know, in some pioneering clinical work that was done for ovarian, in ovarian cancer about 20 years ago at the NCI by uh, Eli Gladstein and then later on at the Penn. The, the big issue here was that um, there's, uh, the ovarian cancer tumors responded really well to PDT, but the um, uh, selectivity was a real issue because you can see this is the disease. It's spread all over, and there was bowel perforations, adhesions, and everything. And so uh, improved selectivity is critical. critical. And so what we did was to create uh, not just a simple conjugate, we've been working with conjugates for a long time, a conjugate that's dark until it's taken, oh, ta uh, uh, taken up by cancer cells. So that would 
presumably give you uh, increased selectivity. And uh, when we've done that in, again, a very disseminated model just like this, which mimics the clinical situation, uh, here's the, it's a published work uh, where it's dark at this stage, opens up, and so it only becomes active, photoactive once it's been internalized by tumor cells which overexpress the receptor for EGFR. This happens to be an EGFR antibody. You really end up, and so, with about a 20-fold ratio. And again, the clinical benchmark has been 1 to 1, 2.1, and in the ovarian case, when Steve Hahn did the study, it was actually 0.9 in many areas. Because remember, this is not what's been reported typically, which is a sub -Q, a tumor on the flank compared to muscle. I mean, those ratios always come out well. We're talking about the bowel to the tumor and the tumor sitting on the bowel. So this is really trying to get real here with it. So, so you know, that's possible. I want to s go uh, uh, in the last next few minutes to this, where Colin gave a beautiful talk on global medicine at Brixen, and this has become an interest of our own group. So, you know, there needs to be a paradigm shift, possibly, where we go from low to middle income countries where PDT is developed uh, to come, you know, come back to the high income countries. In the US, the reimbursement, et cetera, become a big problem. Here, people are struggling with just addressing the problem. Uh, so it's got, and low cost um, is, uh, and locally sustainable treatments are needed everywhere regardless. So we always talk about this being a need in the LMICs, but uh, that's really quite artificial and, and disingenuous. Uh, you know, I can go to parts of Boston. The Mass General is very elegant, but you go to other parts of it and people can't afford those treatments. So here are some of the statistics um, that are given. This was in uh, Nature. Uh, and uh, I want to just point out that more than 70% of the cancers occur in low to middle income countries. So this has been, there has been a switch actually over the years. And uh, there's been the death burden is, is inordinately different. So, and it's moving. So uh, this is really going up and this is uh, coming down. So it doesn't matter. We can't be isolated in this global world. So we have to address this problem too. Uh, so, um, this was uh, one of Brian's uh, uh, provocative um, statements that will be, uh, SPDT will be adopted outside the West, refined and validated at some point in the future and will come back. So, this is sort of that first slide I showed. Um, and, uh, you know, the currents kind of change over time. Typically, they've been gone from here to the east and they may be uh, coming back. Uh, so, uh, but really the drivers, regardless of where it is, the drivers are going to be cost-effective solutions to, uh, to big problems and the socioeconomic and, um, you know, with sensitivity to these, to the environment. And perfection uh, is not a requirement. Now, I will say that there is no perfection in cancer treatment even now, but perhaps in these LMICs that's more tolerable and the barriers to clinical innovation may be lower. So that, that's very important. Um, and I, you know, I would sort of interpret this a little bit more crudely. Uh, possibly, as a whole, the, the dollar factor may be a little bit less because of the misery around. So I think uh, a lot of the barriers come because of that. Uh, but safety would need to be as important in the LMICs as in the HICS. Um, so a few examples here, very quickly. So, uh, you know, oral cancer in India, you know, accounts for 30 to 40 percent of this. Um, claims a life every six hours in India, so this is really a huge statistic. And so we've been, we have a grant right now with the, and sponsored by the NCI to, to uh, address this challenge. So, you know, there are many, many challenges working in India with potential for high impact, though, and uh, there are local regional um, considerations, and not the least of which is that we still have to address these three issues here. Uh, so for now we have addressed it, but I think in the long term we'll, we're going to have to look at this for sustainability, as we said. So, and, and do have to think a little differently. It can't be just taking what we have uh, and trying to apply it. So I'm, I'm not going to spend any time with thinking of uh, doing an integrated treating imaging, uh, treatment and imaging with uh, this usual, which has really taken off, the cell phone thing in many, many labs. Uh, and we're going to try to combine these with the light delivery and handheld uh, battery-powered light sources and LEDs. 
Um, the, I want to actually really compliment uh, Nimi from Duke University, who's really set up a model that we might actually collaborate on and move to, um, and um, it's uh, on cervical cancer, uh, where she's, uh, in, in these countries, there's you know, unnecessary death from cervical can cancer, and um, there are no pap smears. I mean, in India, there's probably 0.1% of the women go for pap smears for various reasons here. Uh, and so, um, what, uh, and cost being a, f a fairly important reason. So Nimi, a um, uh, professor at Duke University, has come up with what she calls the tampon coposcope. And uh, it's very nice and very convenient, and she's right now in India. She's got approvals in uh, Peru and, and, and Nigeria, I believe, to do this. And she'll be doing um, an international multicenter trial with this. Uh, so, um, and here's the picture she sent me. So you see, this is, uh, there's two sets of images taken by coposcopy. And if you look at these, uh, there's, this is the high-end system, 20K, and this is her uh, tampon-based uh, cervical cancer detection. And so what we think is that we need to be adopting some of this, uh, these um, uh, tools that are being developed by a totally different world. The diagnostic world seems to be a little different. I'm finished. Uh, and, um, uh, and do the, um, uh, and, and uh, incorporate PDT in that. So after this, there are some random slides actually that uh, Brian Googled, which has actually come out of Google now. Um, uh, so in China, and uh, you know, one of the major drivers in China is going to be the epidemic of lung cancer. So I see Julie here, she's uh, going to can correct us. But here's the, the cutest picture that I've ever seen. <laughs> so it's, it's from the nearly 60% of the Chinese doctors as smokers. For those of you who've been in the PDT business for a while, might remember Dr. McCon, who used to come out of the OR with a cigarette in his mouth and for a smoke. Uh, he was one of the PDT uh, brave people. Um, so the question is, you know, how are these people going to be um, treated? You know, PDT for lung cancer as we do it now is really not going to be feasible because a lot of this will have to be done in a community base, so the uh, base setting. The oral cancer work that I presented, we've, uh, you know, one of the main drivers for that is to make it adaptable for the community so that it's away from major centers. Uh, so the whole model for the technology needs to be rethought here. Um, so, so again, that presents a huge challenge and an opportunity. Um, in Brazil, of course, there's a lot of this going on uh, for skin and cervical cancer, and uh, there are 100 centers already, but I'm amused and intrigued by this year, where it keeps on expanding. These are the centers that are going to be put in, right? And I just want to warn you, Wenderly, that you're approaching the United States, and we're very good at building fences. So we <laughs> the immigration, the INS might have a fence here. So, so, but I'd like to see you creep through, though. <laughs> that would be useful. Uh, so I think that's um, uh, really uh, um, the last slide for individual countries. And, and I know I've left out many, but this is really in the interest of time. This is what we had. Uh, so, you know, it will be adopted. There'll have to be changes from the standard to the new PDT, which is sort of what I've talked about, uh, a little bit more complex. I don't think we have to be afraid of complexity. I mean, cancer is a complex disease. Uh, there are many uh, needs and opportunities here. Um, you know, it's going to open up a lot of options here for, for therapy. I do think that we need to not be afraid of metastatic disease. We need to do that because none of the drugs are doing it much better either. And uh, we need to have the access to larger and deeper tumors. So here are the conclusions, our conclusions, consensus. Uh, so uh, the photodiagnostics is becoming an accepted uh, form of in medical practice. And it'll be much more powerful uh, when combined with PDT because PDT is inherently a theranostic uh, um, uh, modality. So I, I never fail to point that out wherever I give a talk, particularly to the non-PDT people. Uh, that standard PDT will continue to struggle in the developed world, except for niche applications that I gave you some examples of. But it could have a major impact on global health, 
with, uh, with the appropriate uh, 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 adaptations. And, uh, and I don't see any reason why it needs to always be moving from, uh, medicine needs to be moving from the West to the poorer world. So then paradigm shifts are needed for PDT in science, technology, to make it a major modality in general oncology. So I just want to thank you, and we're done. Okay, I know that we are a little late, but uh, we, we have to open for a few questions to discuss, so please. We just need to be brief and objective. Thank you. So much has been quoted in my work this morning. I would like to answer just a few quick things. Brian, I agree with all you're saying. I just want a little explanation. Why has PDT not got established? Because the proper clinical trials have not been done. And the real problem is with the clinicians not making the effort to set up and run these trials. Surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy, they were not established on randomized clinical trials. They've been established for many years by experience, not by hard science. The fundamental difference with PDT is the nature of the biological effect, which is quite different from all the others. And you need to match that to the disease process that you are dealing with. I won't say any more now, but just say, I hope some of you will hear my presentation this afternoon where I'm planning to answer the queries and show the way forward. Thank you.